Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. My guest today is Sheila McGinnis, MD. She is an associate professor of dermatology and pediatrics. She's also a division director for pediatric dermatology at University of Minnesota. So we're going to talk about uh, what she sees in her research and also her uh, clinical capacity. Not sure of the ratio between the two, but we'll we'll find that out. So welcome, Sheila. Thank you, Richard. It's great to be here. Yeah, if you would tell me a bit about your current practice first. Uh, you know how much of it is clinical, how much of it is research, and then I want to ask you about your background and how you got into this area of study. Absolutely. So I work in academic medicine and I'm a pediatric dermatologist. So I care for children with all sorts of skin disease from the you know most common things like eczema or infections of the skin, all the way to really rare conditions like genetic skin disease. And I am mostly clinical. I would say that, you know, 80% of my work is clinical, but I do do a little bit of clinical research too. And I would say most of my research comes out of the clinical observations that I make when I'm seeing really interested, interesting patients or patterns in patients that seem to be a recurring theme. So mostly clinical here at the University of Minnesota. Okay. And how did you get into uh, the skin game? What uh, got you interested in it? You know, Richard, I always knew I wanted to work with kids. And when I was in medical school, I thought, okay, well, if I want to do a residency in pediatrics, I better check out that what I had thought would be the most challenging part of pediatrics, which would be oncology. So I spent a summer doing pediatric hematology oncology. And at that time on the wards, I came into contact with two patients who had very rare and unusual vascular tumors. So tumors made up of blood vessels. And unfortunately, these tumors were so rare that it seemed that the attendings at the time, and gosh, I'm dating myself, but this is probably 15 years ago now, 20 years ago, they didn't really know what to do or how to care for these really unique babies. And due to complications from these tumors, both of these babies passed away. And I was left with the feeling that, boy, it would be great if someone you know, knew a little bit more about this field. And that field is is the area of vascular anomalies, which was, you know, very much a young and growing field in its infancy 20 years ago. But there's been an explosion of knowledge in this area over the last decade. And I made a decision at that point to really try and become an expert in this field of vascular anomalies. And here at the University of Minnesota, I run our multidisciplinary vascular anomaly center. Our vascular anomaly these neoplasms or from these cancerous tumors or what are they? You know, some of them are cancerous, but the vast majority are actually benign. So I think you might be familiar with the most common vascular birthmark and that that infantile hemangioma, the so-called strawberry birthmark that presents right away in, you know, in little babies. And I treat a lot of those, but there are different types of vascular anomalies and they're sort of put into two buckets. They're either tumors or malformations and the tumors are 
ones that are growing and proliferating and may have complications. And some of those can be more on the malignant or cancerous spectrum. But most of the vascular anomalies that I treat are under the umbrella of vascular malformations. And those ones are benign, but they present at birth and they persist throughout life. And because they present at birth and they are essentially birthmarks, what I found back, you know, 20 years ago was that it was often pediatric dermatologists that were making the diagnosis and managing and caring for this unique subset of patients. And that really is what spurred me into this area of medicine. Well, where do these things come from? Like, what do they look like at inception? How do they start? So vascular anomalies are quite rare, but you can basically have a birthmark made up of any type of blood vessel in our body. So for example, arteries. We can have an arteriovenous malformation that presents at birth and there's a very high blood flow. And often, you know, if an extremity is involved, that extremity can be overgrown, warm to touch. And over time, there's complications that occur because of that high flow state in an arm or leg. And then you can have birthmarks made up of they venous malformations and those ones tend to look blue or bluish on the skin they're compressible they can be just in the skin or they can be very deep in the muscle or even bone and because of that they can have complications down the road as well for those patients like tiny little blood clots within the malformation causing pain and inflammation and sometimes even an underlying problem with clotting I mean, this and is an over question of uh, bed jeff you know in certain sites uh during development they, during uh you know when you're I don't know what they call it, it's beyond development, just when you're alive, as you go throughout your life. But that could have been, you know, an overexpression of VEGF. So I think you're right on the money. VEGF definitely plays a role, those vascular endothelial growth factors. But interestingly, Richard, what we found in the last 10 years in an explosion of genetic information, it turns out that every birthmark that you have on your body is caused by a small genetic mutation in those affected tissues. So I'll use the example of an arteriovenous malformation. So if you had a, an AVM, those little blood vessel cells have mutations in a gene that's involved in this big overall kind of cancer oncogene pathway called the RAS MAP kinase pathway. And so Every birthmark has its own little genetic signature. And that's really been a, a recent advancement, really understanding that birthmarks, whether they're vascular, like I see a lot of, or pigmented, what I see in clinic, like moles, et cetera, they all have a genetic underpinning. Well, the ones that occur at birth, you know, I, I understand that when sperm and egg meets, and, you know, the prospect of, uh, sorry, the process of development. A lot of epigenetic marks are removed. There's also a combination of, you know, mother and father's DNA. Is this an epigenetic phenomenon or is this a genetic phenomenon? Has that been clarified? It's mostly a genetic phenomenon, although I think epigenetics play a role down the line with, you know, the differences in the phenotypes of the patient, but it really is genetic. So for example, we call these genetic events post- zygotic somatic mutation. And that means that, you know, in certain syndromes that you think about, an example of one in, in dermatology would be neurofibromatosis. Patients with neurofibromatosis have genetic changes in the neurofibromin gene. And that genetic change is present in every cell of their body. Like right away, Richard, exactly what you're saying, right at conception, those genetic changes are present. But in a post-zygotic mutation, it's later on in embryogenesis when that mutation arises in that little subset of tissue. So kind of interesting. So, you know, birthmarks have that, you know, during embryogenesis, but then, for example, take moles that occur on your skin and you acquire more over time. And that's because the little pigment cells, the melanocytes are acquiring mutations over time that allow them to grow later. So what happens during the course of someone's life to an angiomas and these vascular issues? Do they either quickly progress to being a problem or do they hang out for years and decades? It's very dependent on what type of vascular birthmark you have. And so I will use the example of infantile hemangiomas. The vast majority of these strawberry birthmarks, about 4% of babies have them. They're more common in girls, more common in low birth weight babies. But 4% of the population have infantile hemangiomas. They show up around, I would say, three to seven weeks and they three to five weeks and they proliferate rapidly during that time. That five to seven week time is when they're really growing their superficial little red blood vessels in the skin. And then they stop growing or they sort of plateau and then they enter a sort of quiescent phase and then they 
involute over time on their own because the body eventually recognizes them as an immature blood vessel type. But some babies have very large hemangiomas. Maybe they even occupy a region or a territory on the face or arm. And the bigger the hemangioma, and depending on the location, they can really be complicated. And so those hemangiomas require intervention. And one of the biggest advances in the field of pediatric dermatology in the last 15 years was figuring out that an old medication, an old medication, a beta blocker called propranolol was effective in shrinking and treating infantile hemangiomas. So now we have an FDA approved, very safe and effective therapy for those hemangiomas that require intervention. Is there any surgical solution to it, like using a part, you know, a twisting mass of vessels, let's say, or what, you know, what is the medication doing? How and how else could it be helpful? So for a long time, we did not understand the mechanism of action. We were repurposing an old medication for a new indication, essentially. Um, it was a group in France in 2008 who first reported that hemangiomas really responded well to propranolol, and that was reported at that time in the New England Journal of Medicine and then led to you know the big clinical trial. The mechanism of action was not known actually until just recently. It turns out that propranolol as a molecule, a beta blocker that many people have taken, we've had it for many, many decades to treat all kinds of different conditions, mostly cardiac, blood pressure, etc. Well, the molecule has two parts. They're called enantiomers. And one of the enantiomers works by inhibiting this pathway called the SOX 18 pathway. And that's a growth factor, actually, and is really thought to be the me mechanism by which propran propranolol works for hemangiomas through inhibition of this SOX 18 pathway. Right. Is there any more intervention needed for these uh, type issues or the medication sufficient for most situations? For most situations, the medication is extremely effective. You know, 90% of patients achieving a near complete or complete resolution. So you had asked before about surgical interventions, you know, way back a long time ago, that was more common to perform surgery on these proliferating hemangiomas, but they were very difficult and challenging to operate on because, of course, the bleeding, they're high flow. And, and then, of course, the scar later on may, you know, may not have an, a desirable aesthetic outcome. But largely, if we get these babies in, you know, before four weeks of age and are able to start those who need it, on this medication. We have wonderful outcomes and we have obviated the need for surgical management. And even, you know, to the point of this medication really is life-saving because sometimes hemangiomas can show up in the liver. And at times in the past, the rapid growth of hemangiomas in the liver would really be devastating, you know, even requiring things like embolization or liver transplant. But with the advent of treatment with propranolol, we, you know, almost never see that anymore. We can treat the hemangiomas is in the liver, they shrink beautifully and the babies do phenomenally well. Do they have to be on the medication forever or they can stop once it's, uh, you know, the area is shrunken enough? Good question. They can stop. So the initial clinical trial had the babies on this medication at a, a good dose, a, a high dose for about six months. And they got the results that I mentioned with good resolution. A lot of pediatric dermatologists will use a slightly lower dose and go a little longer. So I'd say that the majority of babies that I treat with propranolol are on the medication for about a year. What's its mechanism of action? Other areas, when, uh, you know, you have a newborn other areas where vascularization is still happening that could be negatively affected by this? So far, it doesn't look like it, Richard. It looks like propranolol is extremely safe and does not have any long-term sequelae. So we're very fortunate in that regard to have a, a safe therapy. Yeah, okay. Any other uh, conditions? I, I want to ask you about, uh, I just had a note here about urticaria area pigmentosa, which is a condition I know someone has uh, experience with, you know, in children. Do you ever run across that or are there other more important conditions that you want to address? Well, boy, um, Richard, there's like 3,000 skin conditions, so I could talk a lot about any of them, but I, I am so glad you mentioned urticaria pigmentosa because it is something that we see uniquely in the field of pediatric dermatology because urticaria pigmentosa is a form of cutaneous mastocytosis. And mast cells are little cells that have a unique function. They function in the allergic arm of our immune system. And Sometimes babies will present to clinic covered in little tan colored spots. And sometimes the diagnosis with babies that have multiple tan colored spots is urticaria 
pigmentosa, there's a differential diagnosis and we think about other things too whenever we have multiple birthmarks. But urticaria pigmentosa is really unique because it's little clumps or aggregates of mast cells in the skin. And if you practice pediatric dermatology at an academic center and you're familiar with it, typically this is a clinical diagnosis and you don't always need a biopsy. But if you do biopsy a baby that has these little tan colored spots, you would see increased numbers of mast cells in the skin. What's the variation of mast cells and what happens when you have these collections of... So mast cells are part of the allergic arm of our immune system, as I said. In the skin, mast cells can act as mediators of urticaria or hives, and they are full of these dense granules that can extravasate and cause things like histamine release and cause vasodilation and edema and swelling like you would see with a hive, a true hive. In the case of urticaria pigmentosa, these are small little aggregates of mast cells. And if you do rub them with your finger, you might just elicit that phenomenon of histamine release in the skin and see that redness and swelling. And we call that the positive derriere sign. And so that's a nice way to diagnose a mast cell condition in the skin right in clinic. So what happens when a child has urticaria pigmentosa? Do they have exaggerated allergic reactions or like what happens? Thankfully, the vast majority of children with urticaria pigmentosa do extremely well and they have normal childhoods, normal quality of life, and really aren't very symptomatic with, with their condition. What have you seen? What happens to some kids that have urticaria pigmentosa? Are they okay or do they have exaggerated allergic reactions? Like what happens to them? Most kids with urticaria pigmentosa do wonderfully well. And in fact, the lesions themselves in the skin tend to fade over time. And so by mid-childhood, you notice them much less and they tend to be a lot flatter and less symptomatic. In early childhood, if, if the child has quite a few, say more than a hundred lesions on their skin, they might just feel a little bit itchy sometimes. They might get that degranulation in the skin and have more kind of hives or irritation within those little mast cell aggregate. But most of the time they have normal childhood with normal quality of life. And it's not really known to be, you know, an increased risk for things like malignancy, cancer down the road. They do well. What about when uh, kids get into adulthood? Does it literally just completely go away or does like some vestige of it stick, stick with them? You know, there have been some studies on the natural history. And, and I think that it's a fair point that probably the lesions don't completely resolve entirely. You may see still a little bit of hyperpigmentation on the skin or just a little suggestion that there was something there. But the vast majority do improve with time. Okay. I guess if it's okay with you, let, let's go one more first. So, you know, hemangiomas and vascular anomalies to carry a big toe. So what, what other condition that you think is very important to talk about? How about eczema? Atopic dermatitis. Good one. <laughs> I've never heard of that. that. That never happens. But yeah, that's a good idea. Good. Another condition that has just really had an explosion of therapeutic I guess advances in therapies over the past five to 10 years is atopic dermatitis. And atopic dermatitis is just the clinical term we use. We, you know, eczema and atopic dermatitis are often used simultaneously. So children that have atopic dermatitis show up in clinic at around three months of age with red, itchy, scaly plaques on the cheeks and extensors. They're uncomfortable. Often the skin barrier, because of, you know, the etiology of eczema, again, is is genetic based. They show up really itchy, uncomfortable, and often infected. And we see a ton of eczema in our practice. I'd say maybe even 40% of my clinical work on a day-to-day -day is treating babies and kids with atopic dermatitis. So what would you like to know about the condition? Acne versus eczema. Uh, does the public understand what the difference is? Is it obvious or is it, you know, tricky? Acne, like you would see, like regular acne in a teenager? Yeah, right. Acne versus eczema. Do they look similar? Are they totally different? Uh, you know, what's the difference between the two? Acne and eczema are totally different. Yes. So acne is disorder of the pilosebaceous unit, so the oil glands and hair follicles on your skin. And it's kind of a multifactorial condition. It's caused by, you know, genetic hormones of the way your skin slops and bacteria that are on the skin. So it's kind of a multi, there's lots of factors influencing acne. And also the treatments for acne are very, very different in, than eczema. So yeah, the two are considered completely separate condition. Okay. So you see a lot of eczema, 40% plus. It's crazy. What is causing it? Is it many causes? Is it one cause? Is it just 
you know, a genetic inheritance? Uh, what do you see? So I think it's full pathogenesis for eczema is still being worked out, but I do think we know so much more than we did 10 years ago. And what we have found is that there is in children and adults that have atopic dermatitis, there is inherent defect in the skin barrier. There's a protein called filaggrin that is expressed in the top layer of your skin, the stratum corneum. And children and adults that have atopic dermatitis are either missing or deficient in that protein. And this is sort of considered the first step that causes a skin barrier defect and then allows for the you know, subsequent downstream inflammation that we see due to having an altered skin barrier. Why does it seem to happen in certain areas? It doesn't cover a person's you know, total body usually. So why does it happen where it happens and where does it preferentially happen? That's a great question. I, I don't think that the answer to that is fully understood, but one thing that can contribute to the location is where people tend to localize their itching. So peripheral nerves are very involved. For example, in babies, the eczema tends to present on the extensor areas. So the cheeks, the outer arms, outer thighs, and the scalp. That's really the first sign in infancy that of the first location, sorry, in infancy of where atopic dermatitis shows up. Later in childhood, when people are a little bit better, the kids get a little more adept at uh, localizing their scratching and it turns to more the flexor surfaces. So the inner arms behind the legs, neck, and can can all be more involved. And you're right, it does tend to lo localize in those areas, but certainly there are children that are very severe who can have a very, very widespread body surface area of involvement. Well, has anyone categorized the localized microbiome of the skin in the areas with eczema and the adjacent areas that are unaffected? Oh yes, I believe that work has been done. I don't remember exactly the reference off the top of my head, but I, you're absolutely right, Richard, your microbiome varies in every part of your body. And I I do think that parts that are more prone to colonization with Staph aureus would very likely be areas that are more prone to developing eczema. What are some of the common treatments for it and the advocacy of them? Well, I'll tell you, this is an area that is moving quickly and it's been an explosion of amazing therapies. So I'll just try to be as brief as I can because I know we're almost at time. But early in my career, my focus was because we understood that the skin barrier was not working quite right, we really focused on an outside in approach to eczema, repair the skin barrier, optimize the skin barrier, reduce inflammation, try to treat infection. All of those things was really skin barrier optimization, what we try to do and what I still do in clinic every day. So I'll often start by making sure that the parents are bathing the children frequently, applying a bland hypoallergenic fragrance-free moisturizer head to toe in those areas that are inflamed. You need to sort of put out that fire. And a lot of times we'll need a, a topical steroid ointment, for example. And then we also, you know, if something's actively infected, we would need to treat that either with an oral antibiotic or something that I've been a huge fan of in my career. And, it, and you know, there, there's good evidence for doing is doing diluted bleach baths. So children would put, you know, be bathed in a bath that kind of mimics a swimming pool and has a little bit of bleach that helps to reduce bacterial colonization and also, you know, is somewhat anti-inflammatory. So this is really helpful, putting all those treatments together, the bathing, the moisturizing, the anti-inflammatory, and then antimicrobial treatments together can really get you a good outcome and repair the skin barrier in eczema. But sometimes that wasn't enough. Are there any uh, dietary protocols that go along with the bathing and all these other protocols to help people? Are there certain foods that, you know, children or babies eat that uh, seem to make eczema worse? You know, this is a great question and one that so many parents ask me, Richard. So foods themselves don't cause eczema, but having atopic dermatitis makes you more likely to develop food allergies over time. And I think that's a hard concept sometimes for, for people to understand, but I can explain it a little bit if you'd like. So Yes. So I, I described that with when you have atopic dermatitis, there's a defective skin barrier. You're not holding water in the skin like you should, and you're not keeping out bacteria or potential allergens as well as you should be if you say you had enough allegra in, in your skin. So, you know, kids with eczema tend to get more infections, but they also tend to later on down the line develop more food allergies. And I like to use this analogy. So say you're a new mom and you are caring for your child. They have some 
eczema, their skin barrier is not quite perfect. It's rough and dry and red and inflamed. And you are going to make yourself say a peanut butter sandwich. So you go make yourself a peanut butter sandwich. You forget to wash your hands. And then by mistake, some of that peanut butter gets on your child's skin. Well, now that peanut protein is introducing itself to your baby's immune system through the skin rather than through the gut. And that is really one of the big examples that I can use of epicutaneous sensitization. And that means that when things come into contact with your skin, they're being presented to your immune system through a faulty skin barrier. And that derives the development of food allergy over time. It's really interesting. We have found that early food introduction is protective for developing food allergies. That's why we now recommend the AAP guidelines of early food introduction at four months of age, even for all of those highly allergenic foods. It's really better for the baby to get those foods and see them through the gut and teach their immune system how to tolerate those allergenic foods than to inadvertently be sensitized to them through the skin. Yeah, and I see why it's so important to watch what is in the lotions and any Anything you apply to the, the child's skin because the barrier is compromised. So if the lotions have, I don't know, parabens or various solvents or DMSO or whatever it may be, that may get into the body beyond the skin where it should get because the barrier has been compromised. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Baby skin is thinner and they have a higher body weight to surface area ratio. So they are going to be more prone to absorption of all of those types of things. And so, yes, I love to keep things really, really simple at birth. You know, even plain Vaseline petroleum jelly is one of my favorite moisturizers because there's literally nothing in it, no preservatives. It's just a thick hydrophobic moisturizer that sits on the surface and traps the water in. And that's exactly what you want when you have a skin barrier problem where there's water leaking from the surface of the skin. Does lymph come through the skin in those areas because the barrier is thinner? Is the body trying to continuously heal the area? Does it see it as a, you know, a semi-permanent injury and therefore will you get more inflammation or swelling or, you know, immune defense in those areas? So it, it's not really lymph per se that comes through, but yes, when the skin is very red and inflamed, you can see it as being kind of weepy at the surface. So there's like an exudate that can come off. And that's even more so true when there is a bacterial super infection. So if something is weepy or has a lot of exudate, we always take a bacterial culture to make sure we know what's growing and, and address it if it needs to be treated with, say, an oral or topical antibiotic. Is it the bacteria creating the exudate? Or is it um, interstitial fluid and get leaking through the skin barrier or what is it? It's probably your, I mean, it's mo mostly your host immune response to the bacteria. You know, you're creating that purulent exudate. That's your neutrophils coming up in the skin to address the infection. So, you know, and then of course, if there's vasodilation, those vessels are a little leakier, leaking from serous exudate into the surface. So it's, you know, it, it's a combination of those things, but mostly the host immune response to the heavy bacterial colonization. I can see it, but it might be very dangerous for babies or young children to go into a hospital, you know, because he had staph, staph aureus, you know, uh, I don't know, resistant strains of bacteria, et cetera. And if they're able to enter in through lesions in the skin, that would be very bad. So I wonder if there's a, you know, contraindication to keep the kids out of, out of areas where other people are sick with various elements, ailments or, uh, or hospitals. Well, Thankfully, hospitalization for infants with atopic dermatitis is not very common. But you're right. Of course, we're always concerned about the potential for a hospital-acquired infection that's severe. Thankfully, that doesn't happen very often. Okay, good. So one a really exciting area in terms of therapeutic is all of the targeted therapies for atopic dermatitis that have come into the market and are in the pipeline. So I mentioned to you that a lot of my career treating eczema has been focused on like the skin barrier outside in. And 10 years ago, I probably would never have believed you if you had told me that there would be an inside out treatment for eczema, but there is. So when I was discussing that downstream immune dysregulation that happens with atopic dermatitis, there's different inflammatory mediators that are elevated when you've had that chronic inflammation for so long. And some of those are interleukins four and 13. And, you know, about, I think six or seven years ago now, there's been a new drug on the market that is a biologic therapy, a monoclonal antibody directed at interleukins four and 13. And it works extremely well um, from the inside out treating our patients with atopic dermatitis. They, it reduces inflammation and it almost immediately reduces itch. And it really has 
a hugely positive impact on the disease. And so to see this, along with so many other biologic therapies, small molecule therapies coming down the pipeline for atopic dermatitis, it's really an exciting time in dermatology. And it's just so rewarding because before you know, my patients didn't have very many therapeutic options and we were focused mostly on outside in, but now we can really make an impact in other ways and the patients are benefiting. So it's, it, it's really quite exciting. Excellent. Well, very good. Where can people find out more about your practice? You know, what areas do you serve? And in general, about these topics that we brought up, you know, eczema, urticaria pigmentosa, vascular anomalies slash mangiomas, where can you know, concerned parents or family members find out more about the topics. And again, how can they find out more about your practice? So there are a lot of national societies that are dedicated to patient information and educational resources. So I have been involved with the Society for Pediatric Dermatology. Very, I've had a very long career with them so far. And you can find a lot of our work with handouts and information for families, even short videos on some of these conditions at www.pedsderm.net. It's a great resource for families. And I send a lot of my own patients to the website as a resource. For those looking for more information about vascular anomalies, there's also an international society for the study of vascular anomalies. It's called ISFA. So www.isfa.org. Great information. A lot of work has been done on classifying these rare vascular anomalies. Lots of information on ISFA. And then, of course, the American Academy of Dermatology has a lot of resources on its page. So I would encourage, you know, your listeners to, to look look at those three areas if they have an interest in learning more about pediatric dermatology or just dermatology in general. Okay, excellent. Well, Sheila, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for your exuberance and, and interest in all these, these skin conditions. So I appreciate you being here. Well, thanks for having me, Richard. I enjoyed it. The link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.